the Lord is with child one. Come on, put your hands together. Bless the Lord at all times, and God's praises shall continuously be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. For the Lord is good, and God's grace and God's mercy endureth forever. That's Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 1 together. Hear the word of the Lord. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. 
and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love to those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night. Lord, I'm praying for the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands and decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering in your name. Give your servant success today. I'm gonna say that one more time because I want you to get this in your spirit. Let us pray the prayer like Nehemiah. Give your servant success when? Today, by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. And I also want to read the first verse in the second chapter. It says, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
chapter in the book of Nehemiah and looking at just the first part of chapter two, I want to come from the topic today, you better ask for help. Oh, come on, come on now. If you, you at home with somebody, go on and turn to your left and to your right and let them know, you better ask for help. Maybe you're by yourself today streaming. You need to go ahead and say it so that yourself can hear. You better ask for help. Let's pray. God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, for the word says that you are a present help in times of trouble. And so, Lord, it does not matter where we find ourselves. It doesn't matter what limitations we have, what resources we lack, God, that if we come and call upon your name, you are willing to help us. But God, I thank you that you also give us people. And so, Lord, help us today for our hearts to be open, that we might not be afraid to reach out to other folks. We just can't do it by ourselves. I know Beyonce said, me, myself, and I, that's all I got in the end. But God, you've given us people that we might be able to come together and build your kingdom. God, I ask that you would bless this word, that you would touch this preacher right now. In Jesus' name, amen. You better ask for help. How many times have you had a problem bigger than you could handle? But shame and fear kept you from asking for help. Have you ever known the person that could change your situation, but pride kept you from asking for help? Have you ever had a problem so personal that it grieved your spirit? I'm talking about the type of situation that upon thinking about it, a tear comes to your eyes. A, a, a knot develops in your stomach as you remember that thing that you just couldn't fix. You lose your appetite. The house is quiet all around you. Everyone is sleeping. Not a creature is stirring. Not even a mouse. And you lay awake thinking about your issue. And it's not that you don't want to ask for help. You don't even know what type of help to ask for. This is where we find Nehemiah in the text. 
See, Nehemiah is hundreds of miles away from the issue. But how many of you know that space and time does not make you exempt from grief? How many of you know that like Nehemiah, sometimes you're not there, but you still feel that thing. See, Nehemiah is an Israelite born during the time of captivity. His hometown Judah is in bad shape. The wall surrounding Jews Jerusalem has been broken down. The Jewish people have been taken captive by their enemies and they are scattered, displaced from their homes separated from their families and everything that is familiar. Nehemiah is 500 miles away in Persia, living in the palace, working as the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah's brother comes from Judah to visit the palace and he asks about the condition of his hometown. When he receives the bad news that his people are in great trouble and have been disgraced. Nehemiah weeps. See, Nehemiah wants to do something to restore his people's dignity and repair the crushed wall. See, a city without walls would be very dangerous. It is a vulnerable city. It is an easy prey. It would leave Jerusalem open for attack. And this text always makes me take a step back and look at Nehemiah with a proud face. Yeah, y'all know that face. See, the reality is most people are not concerned with problems that are not directly impacting them. We hear about trouble happening in a neighboring city. We hear about trouble happening in a sister church. We hear about something happening in another department, another division, a distant cousin. And our response is empathetic. But we're not going out of our way to get involved. That's too bad. That, that's a shame. <laughs> wow, that's sad. Mm. Y'all know what we say, B -b bless her heart. Bless his heart. But the truth is, there is a part of us saying, it is not my problem. See, it's too easy for us to not get involved when the situation is not knocking at our door. Is that my problem? And this is how we know that it is in fact our problem. When it grieves the heart of God. See, if it bothers God, it should bother us. So guess what? It is our problem. But I'm gonna keep it 100 this morning. It often takes the situation becoming personal for us to care. It was personal for Nehemiah. These were his people. This was his city. And guess what? Nehemiah didn't do, he didn't let comfort and privilege stop him from getting involved. He did not live in the old neighborhood anymore. He lived in the palace. He was protected by the citadel of Susa, meaning that he was surrounded by a wall. Yet, for Nehemiah, it was still his problem. What did he do? What did he do when he was faced with a problem that was bigger than him? What did he do when he couldn't write a check to fix it. <laughs> what did he do when he didn't have the resources needed to solve the issue? After he finished crying. Yeah, it's okay to cry. Every now and then you gotta cry sometimes. Every now and then some tears are going to fall. Every now and then situations are gonna bring you to your knees. But after he cried, he fasted and prayed. Prayer is asking for help. Prayer is getting heaven involved in your situation. 
See, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, prayer is talking to God who is in heaven and prayer is saying, Lord, there are some situations here on earth that do not line up with your divine and perfect will. And I'm praying that you would get involved because I want to experience heaven on earth. Ah, I, I know I got some witnesses this morning. I hope I got some because I feel like preaching this thing. I, I, I have I got some witnesses that have been able to say I've got sickness in my body, but they told me that in heaven, everybody is healed. <laughs> Do I have any witnesses that can say my money is a little bit funny right now, but I heard in heaven, my father owns cattle in abundance and riches. Ah. Do I have anybody that can say my relationships are raggedy and rough? But in heaven, everything is restored. Prayer is saying, I have some situations here on earth that are beyond my control, that are beyond my scope of understanding, that are too deep for my knowledge, that are too expensive for my finances, that are too emotional for my mental health. I need some help. Prayer is saying, God, I need some help. And see, not just any help, but help from on high. If you have a problem, stop carrying it by yourself. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything, not some things, but everything to God in prayer. You better pray about that thing. You better ask for help. Chapter one of Nehemiah is considered Nehemiah's prayer. Let's break his prayer for help down. First things first, Nehemiah did not start his prayer with his request. He, he starts his prayer with acknowledging the one he's praying to. Nehemiah says, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great, awesome God. No matter how big your problem is, you've got to acknowledge that the God you are praying to is bigger than your problem. And you've got to acknowledge that the God you're praying to is greater than your situation. Start out your prayer for help by addressing God to be what God has already done, what God is doing and what God will do. Then in verse six, he says, let your ear be attentive to my prayer. Anybody want to make sure that God hears your prayers? Oh, then you need to be like Nehemiah and you need to ask, Lord, will you just lean your ear this way and will you just hear what I'm saying? It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Can you just lean your ear this way? Second part of his prayer is confession, which means that we have to repent. We acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and we are heartily sorry for these are misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. Get this, Nehemiah not only confessed his own sins, but he confessed the sins of his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather. See, some of the problems that we are facing are generational. And we, as the present generation, when we come into a clear understanding of God's word or repentance for the sins of our ancestors, we have to come and ask forgiveness for stuff that we did not necessarily do. See, that, that's a big one because no one wants to 
to take responsibility for stuff that they feel like they didn't do. <laughs> Y'all know what we say, I just got here. I, I inherited this situation. The, the, the last employee left this mess. The, the last pastor tore this church up. His last girlfriend damaged him. My parents didn't teach me how to budget. They didn't get insurance on the property. You know, we come with all of those excuses, but stop blaming and start praying. Ask God to forgive us of the sins of yesterday. The third part of his prayer, remember the promise. See, in verse eight, it says, remember God, you said. <laughs> you would scatter the people for their disobedience, but you also said you would gather them back in your name and give us a place to dwell. You got to speak God's word and God's promise. See, the final part of the prayer is Nehemiah asked for favor. And not just favor, but specifically favor in the presence of this man. See, this is where we get the quote that we often pray, God, give me favor with you and give me favor with man. But here is my simple definition for favor. Laws are changed for me. Rules are rearranged for me. And people, uh, I'm talking about folks in charge, folks that have the power to change my situation, are going out of their way for me because I am your beloved. You've got to ask God for favor. You got to say, God, give me a favor with my boss. God, give me a favor with my teachers. God, give me favor with my clients. God, give me a favor at the doctor's office. God, give me favor with the contractors. God, give me favor with the repair man. God, give me favor with the person conducting the interview. God, give me favor with the judge. God, give me favor with the parole officer. God, give me favor with the police officer, even though I was speeding. Amen, somebody. Favor. You've got to come and ask God to bless that thing. Favor is God's unmerited grace that allows someone who has the power to help get involved in our situation. Did you get that? A person that has the power and authority to help you out. Don't get it twisted. God has all power. God has all authority. But God will allow the super, the super power of God to intervene in natural situations when we ask for it. That's why we say, Lord, give me a supernatural favor. And because God is all powerful, God is all knowing, God will have solutions to our problems in place before the problem ever occurred. I'm talking about supernatural favor. See, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. God will divinely place you in positions for help. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. See, Nehemiah was a person who handed the king his glass of wine. He had face-to-face -face contact with the king. See, when God gives you favor, it's a divine appointment. God knows what you need. Ask for what you want. <laughs> Ask for what you need. You got to come to God and say, I need some help. Ask God for help. See, God is a present help in times of trouble when you don't know what to do. <laughs> you got to say, I will look to the hills from which cometh my help. <laughs> See, God is working on your behalf. God has set up people in your path who can help you. You need to smile a little bit more. Quit being grumpy. God's placed somebody on your path. Stop trying to figure it out yourself, but you got to come and say, God, I need some help. At the beginning of chapter 1, verse 1, we find that Nehemiah prays his prayer in the month of Kislev. That's November, December. But his prayer is not answered until the second chapter, verse 1, in the month of Nisan, which is March, April. It is four or five months before his prayer is answered. What do you do in between prayer request and prayer answered? I believe that Nehemiah taught us what to do. He was from the city of Judah. He came from a generation of people that called on the Lord. Being a Judite, he would have been taught to stay true to 
who he was. He would have been taught to stay true to what he believed. See, he was from Judah and Judah means praise. We saw Nehemiah cry. We saw Nehemiah grieve, but we also saw him keep on keeping on. We also saw the brother get up and go to work. We saw that he served his king. We saw that he kept doing what God told him to do. So what do you do in between prayer requests and prayer answered, you praise. You praise. You got to get to the point in your life that you trust God enough that God will come and intervene on your behalf. And even if you ask God in November and God still hasn't shown up in December and God still hasn't shown up in January and it's February, you're saying, God, where are you? And it's March and you still haven't seen God show up. You got to know that God is working on your behalf. And so you're not going to let the enemy steal your joy. You're not going to come off of what you believe. You're not going to come off of your testimony, but you're going to praise. And so Lord, I praise you when I don't see you. I praise you when it hasn't quite worked out the way that I thought it should work out. I praise you Anyhow, because I know, God, that there's nothing too hard for you. I know that your promises are true. I know that you're not a man that you would lie. And so if you said it, it must come to pass. And so I'm not going to allow the enemy to cause me to keep my mouth closed. I'm not going to let disappointment from the past keep me from asking you for what I need. But I come to you today, God, and I see some situations like Nehemiah that need to be changed. God, I'm looking at my community. Community. God, I'm looking at my neighborhood. I'm looking at what's happening in the world. And I'm saying, God, I need some help. And so that might be you today. Over these last few months, we've seen a lot. Our hearts have been grieved. Like Nehemiah, you've probably cried. But like Nehemiah, did you come to God and say, oh, God, great and mighty an awesome God, show me what to do. Give me some direction. Put somebody in my path that I can be the difference I want to see. And I don't know how to do it by myself. But Lord, I need some help. And here's what I know about God. As it is you are asking, God is ready to give you what you need. And so there might be someone under the sound of my voice today, that finds yourself like Nehemiah, overwhelmed. The problem is big. You don't have any help. You don't have any money. You don't have any resources, but you've got God. And so if that's you today, I wanna to simply pray with you. A simple prayer that Jesus taught his disciples prayer that gets heaven involved in your situation. Maybe you know what it is that you're supposed to be doing, but fear has stopped you. The fact that other folks said that they had your back and they were going to show up and they sat down has kept you from moving forward. But today, let's pray to the God of heaven to lead you, to guide you, and direct you with everything that you need. Let's pray. God, in the name of Jesus, we come to you today, Lord, and we say thank you. God, we thank you that you are a great and mighty God. We thank you that there is nothing too hard for you, God. We thank you that, Lord, you haven't changed your mind about us even when we change our mind. God, we thank you that you are a present help in times of trouble. And so, Lord, today as a people, we find ourselves like Nehemiah. We see our country in ruin. We see sickness and disease. We see viruses, God. We see hatred and racism, God. We're getting ready to move into the next cycle of this wave that we're in. And we hear the government laying out phases, God, but we just don't know what to do. But we come to you right now, God, 
asking for your divine intervention, asking for your wisdom, God, asking that you would lead us, Lord. Lord, guide our feet, God, direct our path, God. Lord, give us answers to problems that haven't even come up yet. God, we thank you for your Holy Ghost. We thank you for your anointing, God. And the word of God says that we will receive power when Holy Ghost comes on us. So God, give us the kind of power that empowers us to move forward and building your kingdom and in building your kingdom it's helping those that are in need god help us to not be too comfortable hiding behind our education our titles the mere fact that it hasn't really touched inkster so is it really our problem lord help us to not be comfortable there but help us to remember that you've called us to be your disciples that we are your very hands and feet and that we have been called to bring forth the very kingdom of god now, God, for somebody who's feeling overwhelmed right now, somebody who's asking you for help, Lord, send your peace, send your comfort, send your guidance, send your confirmation. Let them know right now in the name of Jesus that they are not alone. And so we praise you, we magnify you, and we glorify your name, God, because of everything that you will do everything that you are doing in our lives to use us as your witnesses. No more fear, no more shame, no more guilt. But today we ask for favor with you and man. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So it's time that we may continue to worship God in our giving. It's time that we say, Lord, I just thank you. I'm giving back to you a portion of what you've given to me. God, you can do more with the 10 versus me holding on to the 100. Now, we have multiple ways that you can give here at Smith Chapel. You might be like me, a young adult who does not carry a, cash, a checkbook or have much cash. Well, that's okay. You can give virtually. You can give via Givelify or PayPal. The information is going to come up for you on the screen or you can mail your offering into the church and we'll also provide the address for you as well but we're going to go ahead and get ready to worship and sing and give you the opportunity to give as we worship God in our giving now as you get your gifts I want you to put them in your hands and hold them up and let's pray this prayer of thanksgiving to God Lord help me to grasp that all the money I think I have is really yours Lord, help us to grasp that all the money our church has is not the church's, but yours. Give us healthy, giving hearts to use these funds according to your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship Cora and Dr. Weaver.
the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and sweet communion of Holy Spirit be with you as you courageously ask God for help, as you courageously allow God to use you to stamp in the gap and intercede for others. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Thank you.